So, um, fortunately, after that delay, I was only intending to talk for 10 minutes anyway, because I think it's better if we spend more time on the discussion and the exercise than listening to speakers. So what I want to do really is contextualise the concept of, a, of assessments, where, at least in my estimation, I think they've come from how we got to where we are now, in other words, which hopefully will set up all the subsequent speakers and give you an idea of um, the sort of progress towards what we want to achieve in the session overall. So thinking about all of that, I thought we might as well start here. Um, the Freer Report, as it became known. How many of you are familiar with that? 1975. How many of you were born when this came out? <laughs> <laughs> Quite a few sheepishly put in their hands. So. Um, okay, so principles of publication. It became apparent even back in 75 that there needed to be some formulation of guidelines towards not just even then people were worried about the amount that people would that we were digging up without actually publishing and archiving dare I say any of the results so um, Shepard Freer led a working party um, on behalf of the ancient monuments board for England how many of you can actually read that mm. not enough oh some of you <laughs> Um, and this is the, the core of it. This introduced the concept of levels one, two, three, and four towards the publication and dissemination of archaeological results. Uh, nothing about archiving, but that wasn't really the brief. So if we're thinking about assessments, it's in here, between level two, levels two and three, that we get the first intimation there needs to be a pause in the process. Um, an idea that um, at some point in between full data recovery and dissemination um, you need to think about what it is you're going to do next. And that was taken on further in the Cunliffe report that came out in 83, a follow-up if you like to this. It still uh, hung on to the concepts of levels one to four, um, but it set out a programme towards publication Obviously, whatever Freer and his working party had done wasn't enough between 75 and 83. And, um, and so Barry Cunliffe was brought in to head up another working party um, uh, on behalf of the CBA and the Department of the Environment, as the Ancient Monuments Board had become, um, to produce this. Now here, we get an idea of um, this, this sort of hiatus, this assessment process actually taking root. Um, upon completion of excavation, a research design for post-excavation <coughs> work must be prepared. So that's the point at which um, you think about what you have to do next and formulate that into some sort of um, revised project design, as we would probably call it now. <coughs> From there, English Heritage, all on its own, <laughs> in uh, 1989, produced the first version of MAP. It's not called MAP 1, <laughs> it's just called MAP, Management of Archaeology Projects, um, which was introduced by Jeff Wainwright. Um, the purpose of this document is to... Can you read that? Mm -hmm. Oh, good. I won't read it to you then. Um, so it's, it's, it's to take the principles set out in the Cunliffe report and uh, put them into practical guidance. So this was an attempt to, um, to talk people through the process, not just set out what the process would be, but help them to achieve it. Um, and it says quite clearly that although this was initially conceived as something that would be of use for English Heritage funded projects, either ones that English Heritage were carrying out themselves or that they were paying other people to do. Being English Heritage, it thinks that whatever is good enough for English Heritage should be good enough for everybody else. And so um, it's what English Heritage, it's a statement of what English Heritage regards as good practice in project management. In other words, 
take this document uh, and follow what it says because we know what we're talking about. Um, and here, for the first time, the word assessment appears. Once the site archive and narrative account of the site is complete, an assessment of the project should be undertaken. Very clearly says that um, it's important to, to plan the next stage. It also says that it's most important that specialists should be in a position to examine the material in enough detail to determine whether or not further analysis work is justified. From the fines group perspective, that's the nub of why we're going today. The relationship between those specialists and the assessment process and how that works currently with the sort of situation of freelance self-employed specialists being perhaps on the fringes of the assessment process if they take place in-house in larger organisations. How does this play out? I suppose is one thing we could think about today. And what is the assessment process as it's currently conceived supposed to do uh, when you're trying to herd so many cats? Map 2, 1991, <coughs> produced this really helpful flowchart so that you could visualise the project planning process. And assessment is stage three of that, assessment of potential for analysis. <coughs> so this, in stage two, at the end of field work, you're supposed to identify assessment costs, agree assessment costs at the beginning of stage three, do the assessment, produce the report, and then decide where to go in terms of analysis from that. Sets it out very clearly. This document, again, was produced ostensibly to manage English heritage projects, but was put out there for, um, I might have put that into a slide, um, to, uh, to inform anybody managing an archaeological project and to help. And this sort of map two, when it came out, um, created more, much more of a stir than the, the initial version. Became, uh, in one, on one hand, a target for people who were complaining that English Heritage was always telling them what to do and how to do it. And on the other hand, um, people were concerned that the whole fieldwork planning process was going to get clogged up in this sort of system. Uh, and assessment became, uh, to some people I think, a, um, a way of, uh, I don't know, of um, slowing down the whole process. I'm not sure if that really is what happened, but it created problems and there were lots of discussions. I remember I was at the DUA at the time in London and there were lots of internally there, people producing notes and documents on how to, um, how we should address the project planning process, stimulated largely by the appearance of this document. Um, <clears throat> from a fines point of view, from any point of view, this is the, 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 the real crux of MAP2 and its, its approach to assessment a pivotal point in the execution of an archaeological project. Is that still the case? Is a question we could ask. Um, and is it true of a watching brief or a desk-based assessment or a building survey or is it specifically for large-scale fieldwork projects? Is there a scale at which assessment becomes uh, less of a pivotal point than it might have been originally? <coughs> Morph is the successor to Map 2. Um, sorry, that's the, the wrong version. <laughs> the, um, and here, in this even more helpful flowchart, is the central part of this document. How many of you use Morph? How many of you use Map 2? Yeah, a few. Nobody used. Nobody put their hands up when oh, I said more. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. more. Well, yeah. uh, <laughs> <laughs> you, you, you make somebody else use more. Like <laughs> uh, so uh, the the project manager's guide. Um, here we've got assessment of potential. So this is. Um, 
How would you describe morph? It's a, a less specific document than MAP2. It's more intuitive, should we say. Um, and it's certainly helpful if you're, if you're applying to Historic England now for, for any grant aid. Um, but it's never had the impact outside of Historic England or English Heritage that MAP2 did. Um, and it really is just a streamlining of MAP2 into something more generic, I think, um, would be fair to say. Um, alongside all of that, <coughs> which you could regard as sort of a national heritage perspective, CIFA and its predecessor, the IFA, produced standard and guidance for archaeological excavation. Of, the, of all the SNGs that I looked at, this is the only one that really mentions assessment, which is interesting. It's not really, doesn't really figure in the guidelines for fines work or working with archaeological materials, as it's called. Um, so, but it does say post excavation report should be produced. Uh, it will form part of the project archive. It should include a statement on the quantity and perceived quality of the data. It's actually a very useful summary of what the purpose of assessment is. Despite the fact that it says it's 2014, this was really written back in the 90s, so maybe it's time to review that too and think about how that might be updated uh, as part of our discussions today. Um, it even in the guidance tells you what the, con the contents of post-excavation assessment report should be, uh, culminating in a summary of the potential of the data from local to international significance. And that's good, that is what we should be doing. As I say, whether that's relevant to every archaeological project or not is open to question. Oh, here we are, here's the, the fines one. Uh, it does say further analysis should not proceed without the assessment. So, it does, yes, sorry, it does include post-excavation assessment. Um, it cannot be undertaken without knowledge of its provenance. It actually sets out terms for the sorts of expertise that should be introduced into the assessment process, and that's part of the remit of the fines group, is to ensure that most processes are undertaken by people who know what they're doing, or specialists as we like to call them. Um, and then bringing us further up to date, October 2015, this is leading into the uh, next paper, Algeo produced their advice note for post-excavation assessment, which is a far more um, detailed examination of the subject and really where we should be starting our discussions today, as we'll be hearing in a minute. Uh, it sets out when it should happen. Uh, it gives it its own little acronym, PXA, which is now commonly used. Um, it will assess the potential of the site, uh, and it will be a statement of significance, and it tells you what the content, what the, these are the, the contents of this document, which basically give us a set of questions which could inform our discussions later. What is PXA? When? Why? What are the objectives? What should be in it? The role of the specialist and who is it for? And who is our, you know, who is it for now? Is it for the people carrying out the project? Is it for the uh, planning archaeologist? Is it for the client, or is it for the consultants who work for the client? Because, or is it for all of them? <laughs> and can it can it actually be for all of them? In, in, in a single manifestation? Those are the questions that we could be asking. From a specialist point of view, if your specialist is usually working for a project, a project is working for a client, and is that relationship possible? You know, is it possible to satisfy every requirement of all those different relationships in one exercise? I suppose that's a question we could also ask. And at that point, I will stop and hand over to Kasia to take us into the realm of well, further look, looking further detail at this.